uh, thank you guys so much for joining us for this panel. You know, there's a lot of misunderstanding, I think, about the Common Core, what it is. People assume that it gives us a guide to what children should do in school all day, and it doesn't. It is merely a standard. And there is really a lot of divergence in the way different uh, departments of education obviously devise content and curriculum. And there's a feeling, I think, that we're really on you know, two paths. We're on two paths in so much of our society. But in education, we're teaching wealthy children with a lot of creativity and joy, those are the buzzwords in progressive schools, progressive private schools, very well-funded public schools. The idea is that these children are doing project-based learning, and they're studying China, and it's China while you're making lo mein and doing maps of the provinces, and it's glorious, and children in urban schools are doing rote learning and memorization. And is that necessary? Are we depriving these children? One thing I really wanted to ask you guys, Amanda has written a lot about education all around the world and best practices around the world. If we had an actual standardized curriculum, standardized content, standardized practice at the federal level, we did not leave it to municipalities, would some of this inequality uh, divergence with that issue, would it, would it solve that issue? Do we even need to solve that issue? What, what I'd like to You know, to I get. think it's sort of like a single payer healthcare system. Like, that would be lovely. That would be lovely to have a national curriculum. It is, is not going to happen in the United States when I'm alive. That doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it, though, right? Like, I think and what, it's the just biggest of our problem. Yeah, I mean, we, can't even, we can't even agree on standards. Right, so, right. so, when I visited schools in other countries with much better outcomes on, by almost anything you can measure, one of the things that strikes you coming back to the United States is the, the noise, like the lack of coherence and focus. Um, American schools do many, 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 many things, most of them not very well. Um, and I would actually argue even for wealthy kids, we do math very poorly. Right. So compared to? Compared to, like, so the top quartile of richest American 15-year-olds who are very well off and have every manner of resources and advantages, those kids score below their affluent peers in 26 other countries in math. So, you know, that is not actually for all the low main and <laughs> other fun projects. Uh, and iPads and, and great Even uh, in wealthy schools, resources. We're not, right. We are not serving kids well at any income or age group in math. But you're right that the equity problem in the United States is getting worse compared to other countries. So yeah, do you want to? Yeah, I, there, I, I work at a Washington-based education policy think tank. I teach at a charter school. So I kind of have one foot in the policy world, one foot in the practice world. Um, it's not a mystery why we've gotten to this place. You said, should there be a national curriculum? Well, right. you know, I, I've been the guy for years saying, Curriculum is the most important lever we're not pulling. It's not going to happen, not because we don't want it. It is literally unconstitutional. You know, you, you right. cannot impose a curriculum. Much of the battle over Common Core standards was this uh, false idea that we were imposing exactly that. Standards are not a curriculum, to your point. It's more like standards like auto safety standards or building codes or whatnot. It doesn't tell you what to drive, what to eat, right. et cetera. Um, you know, the, the, the problem that we have in education reform, um, to put on my policy hat for a second, is, is that if you think about what we do in education policy, we're only concerned with structures, uh, charter schools, data, teacher quality, right. testing, accountability, on and on and on. It, that list, and it's a longer list, says nothing about what kids do all day. So Amanda, you, know, you went around the world looking at high-performing school systems, and we were talking about this before we came out. Correct me if I'm wrong, every single high-performing nation has a national curriculum. Right. right. There's no mystery about what gets taught in <clears throat> Finland, in Japan, etc. cetera. Um, here, and, and by the way, they do fight about it, though. Oh, it's sure. not like it's all good. Like every, I mean, every five years or 10 years when they rewrite the national curriculum, there are big yes. fights. Right. Even so in Finland and Japan and Korea and Poland, there are big fights right. about what should be in it, what shouldn't, how many hours should go to foreign language. Right. And, so this is difficult stuff in every country, but at least you know they do have a chance of some coherence. It's think, one fewer moving part. Yeah, yeah. In other words, if you think about the way, and I speak as a, as a classroom teacher, somebody yes. who went through ed school, um, we make this job enormous 
inordinately difficult. Yes. Uh, we have 3.7 million teachers in this country, and they are men and women of ordinary sentience, because if you have 3.7 million of anybody, <laughs> right. that's what you're going to have. But our model is predicated on finding 3.7 million superstars. Mm. Good luck with that. Right. If you have a curriculum, whether it's a national curriculum or states and districts take one voluntarily, it's one fewer moving part. In other words, what is the soul of teaching? Do, you, do I want my child's teacher to be an expert instructional deliverer or an expert instructional designer? Those are two very, very different jobs and they are extremely difficult. So choose, it would be my argument. Um, as, a, as a teacher, I wish somebody had given me a curriculum. It would have allowed me to focus on examining student work, developing relationships with my students, with their parents, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, I spent 30 hours a week doing what? Planning lessons. Yeah. Uh, interesting study just came out from Rand. Uh, where do 98% of American teachers get their lessons from, some or in part, all or in part, from Pinterest, from Google. Wow. Right. 98%. Right. And, you know, there is in the urban education dialogue, there is really, we are very, very stuck on this debate of, you know, charter schools. Sure. Teachers are, you know, it, it, unions are terrible. Charter schools are the answer. And or the reverse. <laughs> or the reverse. <laughs> or the reverse. <laughs> and we certainly do a lot of romanticizing about teachers yeah. and ev every successful person in a profile and fortune or here or whatever is always talking about that incredible seminal moment with a brilliant, fantastic, but a great teacher. And, you know, again, how do we get this message out that they're, exactly there are just not gazillions of people, super ambitious, super brilliant, who are going to want these jobs for $40,000 a year stuck in this world of policy that never changes right. also. I mean, it's a, it's yeah, a, although I think there are some like, I mean, I think there are some incredibly ambitious very talented I'm people overstating. Who, I'm, would, yes. who either are teachers or would be teachers if it were treated more seriously. So sure. like DC public schools where my kid is enrolled now pays their teachers more than any district in the country. And you know you can make six figures there when you're 27. If you do a great job and work in low income school, you can buy a car, you can buy a house, which is the way exactly. it should be, right? So I, I do think there's now like a handful, six to 10 districts in the United States that are paying their teachers the way they should, like competitive with other professionals. So this is not as impossible as it sounds. That said, you're right. not going to get the whole country sure. right onto right. onto the track of like that we like teachers to be. And, on. and higher pay alone. I'm not against higher yeah, pay. Yeah. Believe me, I'd like higher pay. <laughs> Um, that's not necessarily the magic bullet. Yeah. Uh, my point is if the job is more doable, you're going to get a totally. lot more teachers yeah. who will persist past that two, three year mark where yeah. I think uh, half of them or more leave the field altogether. Yeah. But I think in the United States, money is a signal of respect. Sure. So whether we like it or not, that is. But you know, you're right. I mean, Spain has the highest paid teachers in the world and they have like really abysmal results. So right. there's not a direct There's relation. not a direct correlation. But I, I've also, I've argued for a long time in my own work that there are plenty of professions, journalism for instance, where you do not, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you are, you are not uh, voluptuously paid. But look at the but, prestige. But right, the, right, exactly. There, that we have lost with teachers we've lost there are plenty of people who will do things it, it, for high status and, and and suck it up and 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 not you know have a lot of the things you can buy with a lot of money but we don't teachers don't have that yeah yeah no, there was a teacher I met a, a student teacher she was studying to be a teacher in Finland so Finland getting into education college in Finland which is a top performing country in the world is like getting into MIT in the United States so they only accept Imagine about that, 10%. Really. I mean, and they didn't, by the way, they weren't always that way. They used to accept anyone with a pulse like we do. So anyway, that's hopeful. But another story. Um, I met this, this young woman um, at, at a, an event in Missouri, I think it was. And she came up and she had like little, you know, like Nordic glasses and like a leather jacket. And I was like, are you from Finland? And she, uh, <laughs> she said, yeah, I'm here on an exchange program. I'm a university student. And I said, oh, great. And she said, I'm studying to be a gym teacher, phys ed teacher in Finland. So. Yeah, I said, well, okay, great. So I said, stop everything. I'm going to go buy you a drink at the hotel bar. So I just like picked her brain. And I said, so what is different? And I, I, I had all these ideas, of course, about what she was going to say, and what I hoped she would say about the classes and the rigor of the work and blah, blah, blah. And you know what she said was the biggest difference between education college in Finland and education college in the US? The biggest difference was not in class. It was not even in her student teaching, which is so incredibly important. It was at parties. <laughs> So she'd go to parties, like a normal, you know, 24-year-old or whatever, and she would run into, you know, meet new people for the first, and they'd ask, you know, what do you do, what are you studying, and she'd tell them, and she'd tell them, I'm, I'm studying to be a teacher. And, like, there's this sort of, like, glazed thing that would happen with their eyes, 
and they would move on to some new topic. Whereas in Finland, when she told people that, you know, there was this like energy, right. like, oh right. wow, what, what kind of teacher? What do you? And she hadn't realized that her identity was wrapped up in that status until she lost it, right? But there was something there that was ineffable, but very, very right. valuable. Yeah. Right. By the way, we're doing it again. Okay, so I started my remarks here by saying we only talk about the structure. <laughs> yes, around, right, right, right. Yes, yes, exactly. And yes. we never talk oh, about what kids learn all day. We and set, here we we're set, doing set. it again. Another something else I wanted to talk about in terms of what the, the difference between poorer schools and wealthier schools, in terms of how kids spend their time, is discipline, which is a big issue. I had a, a teacher uh, who worked in a charter school in Brownsville, Brooklyn, poorest neighborhoods in New York, an African American teacher, and she was very disillusioned by this you know, boot camp model of discipline. She had to tell a child who didn't have the uniform to go home one day. And, and, um, are, and she said, she said, are we, you know, are we creating a, uh, a, a community of young minority children who are going to be submissive and, uh, and not rebellious and creative in that way? Mm. And I wanted to know if you guys had thoughts about that. Is there, you know, it can be very touchy-feely in a wealthier all-white school, oh. for example. I don't, I'm not uh, sure we have uh, enough time uh, to unpack oh, right, this, right, this, right. this entire. Uh, Twenty seconds. Unpack. Yeah. No. I mean, <laughs> it, it's important. And look, you know, I, I will. I will make no excuses for no excuses education. That's my orientation. That's the school I teach in. Um, those the, the, the worst criticisms of no excuses education comes from those who've never set foot in one. It's so, but it's, I think right. it's important to remember what that means. People hear no excuses and they think there's no excuses for the kids. No, it means no excuses for the adults, uh, because you're dealing with disadvantaged kids. Um, who have been failed systematically generation after generation. It stops now, no more excuses, let's get these kids where they need to be. Um, so with that as a backdrop, why is there what might, by the standards of Brearley or Dalton or collegiate, harsh discipline? It's not about discipline, it's about maximizing the use of time. Mm -hmm. um, because kids come into these settings with profound deficits in terms of vocabulary and knowledge. Uh, Doug Lamov, whose work we both admire, has really made a study of this in terms of how do you maximize time on task um, for, for, for teaching. He, he's kind of the guru for a lot of these schools. It, it, this is not about you know, the school to prison pipeline and whatnot. This is, you know, but I, I read some of these accounts and I expect to see in my school and others, you know, kids in orange jumpsuits being frog marching right, right, the right. It's not like that. Right. Is, is it rigorous? Is it serious? Is disruption uh, taken seriously? Yeah. Having taught in a chaotic public school for many, many years, it's a breath of fresh air. It allows me as a teacher, it sets the starting line that allows me to get what I need done, done. Right. Uh, but I do worry that we've kind of, the, the, the pendulum has swung too much that we're, we're kind of um, just marginalizing this kind of education that's proving quite effective. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, you're right. This is a really big and important topic, but I, I think, you know, it, you can do no excuses well. You can do it terribly. You can, Absolutely. I mean, execution is everything, like with everything. Uh, but I do think what distinguishes the United States from other countries is not about the charter versus non-charter debate. or right. It's about police in schools. So we have police in our schools arresting kids. This is not normal. Um, other countries don't do this. Once you have police in schools, they do what police do, which is they arrest people for violating laws. So. We have seen again and again in studies that the more police you put into schools, the more arrests you have. When a kid is arrested, even if, even if those charges get dropped, mm -hmm. he's twice, he or she is twice as likely to drop out of school. There is a message that is sent that is hard to recover from. This is not how kids learn. So kids have to have consequences. Kids have to be mm -hmm. held accountable, as right. any teacher will tell right. you. But it cannot be permanent damage that removes you in handcuffs from the premises. The so that, that's, and that happens in many, many places around the country. And it has been happening for a long time. It is changing in some places. I hope yeah. the pendulum is, is swinging back. But that is something that has to do with race, it has to yep. do with um, zero tolerance policies that came right. along in the 80s, and it has to do with fear of school shootings. The trouble is that the pendulum never stops in the middle. Right. Yeah, I'm serious. Yeah, you know, we, nobody's removing police from schools. So fair, fair I don't enough. think we're there. I don't think we have to worry that the, it's going to go too No, but uh, my, my, my point, I don't want to you know, uh, paint with too broad of a brush because yeah. these are nuanced yeah, uh, yeah. issues. Um, but we forget why discipline matters because you have to create the conditions for learning. And if the message goes out as it inevitably does, oh, don't suspend kids anymore, especially low income kids of color, because then the OCR, the, the Department of Education Civil Rights Apparatus, right. will, will come after you. Well, then teachers and schools and districts get the message, oh, we're not going to suspend anybody. Body, then it's chaotic, then nobody learns. Or they and arrest them instead, which a lot of schools have done. Right. Right. I, I want to get to another divisive issue, which is homework. 
Um, you know, in, in, when I visited schools in poor communities, you see children who are going home and they're making, they, they have to make dinner for their siblings. They're there, the parent in charge, if they're in seventh grade and they're taking care of the fourth grader. There is not a lot of time necessarily for homework. There are not parents with, you know, they're parents with two or three jobs. They're not on the ground to help with the algebra homework. Um, so what, there are studies that really show us that homework doesn't have much value anyway. So what can we do in this Homework yeah, I don't have strong feelings about it. I do think it's one of those kind of worried well things where you get more noise about homework at the high end than the low end. Uh, you know, my, the question I always raise uh, is, is it the homework or are you just giving bad homework? Right, you don't want busy work. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the evidence shows that American kids actually do quite a bit of homework compared to kids in other countries, particularly in middle school and high school. Um, the evidence also shows, as you mentioned, that it does not lead to learning. It does a little after middle school, but in, in from kindergarten through until middle school, there's no evidence that it leads to learning. And I think, to me, it's another example of this kind of noise, like this lack of focus and priorities about what matters. Like, we know there's just a few things that parents can reliably do in every time zone in the world that lead to learning and thinking for kids. And one of them is reading with your kid when they're little and when asking them questions about what they're reading. And if we just sent every kid home with that every day, reminder, reminder, read to your kid, here's how you can do it, here's when you can do it, here's something to read, that would be far more productive than sending worksheets and packets. Right. And so, but there's, there's not a consensus and clarity about what leads to learning. And so when you have that lack, I mean, I, you know, parents in my kid's school complain if there's not enough homework. Right, I'm like, right, right. Really? right. Except that... for the people who are complaining about too much. Right. You know, <laughs> um, Google is starting this, uh, a, Google, a former Google executive, excuse me, is starting uh, schools around the city called, uh, around the country, cities around the country. There's some in New York, open in Chicago, San Francisco, called Alt School. And mm -hmm. there's just all of this template is really blown up and Part of it is no homework at all, but the assumption is your parents are so interesting <laughs> and brilliant <laughs> at home that they're going to be talking about Kafka at dinner. So you know you don't right. need homework, um, which uh, you know is an extreme that I, I don't think we want to embody necessarily. What uh, I'd like to go to some questions from the audience now. Yes, sir, in the back. I didn't expect to be talking about this today, and it's a little bit personal. Um, I'm the CEO of a city technology company here in Manhattan. I used to be the VP of strategy at a company called DigitalOcean, which we grew into the second largest cloud hosting provider in the world. I don't know a lot about education, but I do know a lot about learning disabilities. Um, I would consider myself autistic on the, dyslex, on the dyslexic side of the um, learning spectrum. If I could describe what was happening in my head, you probably wouldn't believe me. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> even if I, you did, you wouldn't understand it. Um, everything is everything to me all the time, and nothing is anything, which makes it very difficult for me to learn. A word is not a word. It's just there. It's a word when I decide to make it a word, but otherwise, it's just there. The education com system completely failed me. I effectively cannot read. I mean, I can read but I can't read. Reading for me is a completely different thing. If, and I grew up in the UK, so wrote was just all they did, all day, all day, all day. If I had been in the Steiner education system or something like that in my early life, I imagine that I would have been able to learn to read. Or at least I would be able to read quite quickly. So when you talk about a standardized education system, I cry inside. That is the most scary thing I could imagine. Because I grew up in one, and it failed me so badly. And I'm very, very happy that I have privilege and that I've been able to get to where I am. But if it were not for that, I would not be here. May I? Yeah. Um, I think it's important to, to be clear what we mean when we say standardized. People hear standardized, and they think, uh, kids sitting in rows, reciting dates, and what, that is not what standardized education is. We don't have time to unpack this, um, but language proficiency doesn't much care what we think about standards. Language is standard, and, and to your point about privilege, there, there is a dominant language culture, and most of us in this room are part of it, and the kids that I teach are not. Uh, and, and at the risk of painting again with too broad of a brush, that leaves us with educators as a decision to make, and it's a critical one, because we're gonna be okay. Uh, the kids that I teach, if they grow up outside of the dominant language culture, um, there is a whole set of 
I, I, you can't overstate how much is taken for granted vocabulary and background knowledge we all possess that the kids that I teach do not have. So when I say standardize, what I'm talking about is opening that world to them, sharing with them what I know, what you know, that we all know that they do not get by dint of uh, the fact that they do not grow up with educated parents, they don't have uh, the enrichment opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not about standardization per se. It's about starting from the, 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 the point where we recognize that those of us in the dominant privileged culture just show up, show up at school on day one with an extraordinary amount of knowledge and vocabulary that if we do not give to, to low-income children, we are functionally choosing a form of illiteracy for them. I, I mean, educators who work in low-income schools say all the time the number one problem first day of kindergarten, you say, what's the most serious problem you face? Everybody will say word deficit. Just Boom. the vocabulary you get having parents who are talking to you all the time, the, the value of that is enormous. Other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Yes, um, speaking on the other side of the, of the spectrum about the privileged kids and disadvantaged, or I'm sorry, you know, privileged kids and a couple of years ago, I went to a talk. Um, it was, a, I think, a better, fairly well-off school district in, in South Jersey, where I'm from. And there was the, a woman that had made a documentary about too much uh, homework being given to kids. Mm -hmm. and oh. They don't have time. You know, they're being overstressed. They can't do all these activities to nowhere. get into a prestigious college. And mm -hmm. I remember that at that particular um, session or seminar, there was some people that got up and they said, well, in India or, or you, know, I, you know, here America has, in a sense, it's almost too, too comfortable. Like, I think our school year, for instance, is shorter than a lot of other countries, like in, I think in Japan and, you know, in India. So I kind of got the impression that, in a way, maybe our, our kids or our, uh, children have gotten a little bit soft, if you will, like, you know, maybe compared to some of these other countries. So I just wanted to kind of see uh, if the panel had any additional feedback on that. Yeah, I mean, I think statistically, our kids spend as much or more time in class as kids in many higher performing countries. So it's, again, there, it's like it's complicated, right? It depends on what you're doing with that time, right? But I'll just quickly tell a story about a girl named Elena who was from Finland and went uh, on exchange to Michigan. She was a high school student living with a family and attending public high school. And, um, and she went to, you know, decent public high school in Michigan, the suburbs. And uh, she, in a lot of ways, it reminded her of Finland. Like, everybody at her school was white. It was cold. Like, it was not that different. <laughs> and, uh, but there were certain differences that really struck her. I mean, she didn't think the kids were dumber or smarter. Like, the kids, kids are very similar. That's what kids will tell you. It's kids who've lived in other countries. You know, they're very similar. The difference was um, that she felt like less was expected of the kids. Hmm. So she had a lot of homework, but a lot of it was, like, making posters. She, <laughs> she felt like she was making a lot of posters. And she isn't really sure why. Um, on her first math test, she got 105%, which she had not known was mathematically possible. <laughs> on a math test. <laughs> math test. Math test right. um, so, you, but she, she had a great journalism teacher, just to end this little uh, an anecdote. And a great journalism teacher. America has great teachers, and kids from other countries often comment on how interactive their classes are compared to classes in other countries that are more sort of hierarchical. And, for that class, the end of semester project was you had to write 10 stories. So Elena went off and did that, and she came to class on the last day, and, and she was the only one who'd done it. So she just felt like there was systematically less expected of kids in academics. The opposite was true in sports. Hmm. And that's a different panel for another day. Right, I, but right, I, I, right, right, there's right. There's something going on there. It varies a lot from place to place, but there's something going on there, and I suspect it has to do with the fact that historically in the United States, you did not have to be good at math to thrive and right. have a full life, and that's now changed. But Amanda, by the same token, how many stories have we heard about the overstressed teen and how we're expecting too much? And yeah. I'm not saying The Times right. has written all of those stories, every single one. <laughs> <laughs> one. Time for one very quick last question, sir. I'm a design educator at the university level. I'm also the parent of a daughter who went through the Finnish education system. Oh, interesting. And I would absolutely simply want to underscore the literacy discussion yeah. 
sure. which is so fundamental to any society, but certainly I think informs the excellence of that education system. But more particularly, I want to come back to the idea of maybe it's um, autonomy, autonomy of the teacher and mm -hmm. autonomy of the student, and to what extent uh, a standardized curriculum, as you've begun to suggest, yep. can provide still for, for those mutual autonomies. Yeah, real quick answer, because we're out of time. Love me some project-based learning. Love me some student-centered pedagogy. Just maybe not K-5. In other words, if you, if you, if you uh, I'm just throwing out, not thinking out loud here, but if you have an education system that has more in common than not from pre-K to say fifth grade, maybe eighth grade, then all these things that we lionize at the high school level, all the great projects and individual learning, then you've created the conditions where that bears fruit. You know, if you don't build a foundation, especially among uh, low-income kids, English language learners, language poor students, then you're just, you're kind of banging your head against the wall. Exactly. You're not creating the conditions for success. Very illuminating panel. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you.